Welcome into the Jets Nation Radio, sponsored by Betway. Make sure you like and subscribe to Jets Nation Radio so you never miss a podcast. Welcome into Jets Nation Radio. I'm Angus Hout. And be sure to check out the latest NHL odds. I mean, just any odds. Go check out Betway. Go check out Betway. They're a sports book. Uh, yeah. Ray, how's it going, buddy? Pretty good. Pretty good. We're seeing a lot of Jets news coming up in oh, yeah. the coming days. Yeah, this good... bio, do watch trades. It's it's really picking up. Yeah. Well, let's start with Pierre Luc Dubois. I mean, as we're recording, there hasn't been an official trade yet, but we have been hearing more and more rumblings. And where there's smoke, there's fire. And there's a whole lot of smoke yeah. coming out of Los Angeles. Um, basically, the LA Kings and Pierre Luc Dubois are working on an extension as of right now. Yeah. Uh, and then he's most likely being traded to LA. I mean, it's more or less a for yeah. sure thing. Um, expected to come this way would be Gabe Velarde and Alex Iapello. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. Uh, and well, LA is expecting a yeah. tra- uh, an extension. So good trade. Where, where are we at with this one? I'd say like those two fundamental pieces that are been talked about is pretty good. We still don't have the full trade. So I I'd, yeah. I'd hope to see like maybe a pick or two or a prospect also be added, but those two pieces, like they are pretty good pieces. Like they're not going to be your next shiny thing. Like they're not going to be like a point of game player, maybe, but Velarde still on, only 23 years old and he had a breakout season this past year. So you could almost see him becoming like a 60, 70 point player next year. And I follow is a great kind of cop S player where he can be slotted into your top six. He can be slotted into your bottom six. He can play the second power play. He can play the PK. Like those two players just give a lot of versatility to this lineup and a good bit of, uh, amount of size as well. Like I think Velarde is six, three and I follow is like six, one or six foot. Like it's definitely like a different kind of change because Dubois is one player and you're getting kind of two roster players back for him. But ultimately, I think it's better than what Montreal would offer because we know Montreal has always been kind of hovering around Dubois even for like the past year. And to get someone like Filardi, it's really encouraging and kind of allows for upside and see and, and actually having that roster player too. Yeah. And like Villardi there, he's like kind of giving me some hope as well. Like, 23 goals in 63 games and 41 points altogether. So, you know, we get some skill out of him, some scoring skill, 6 3 2 15. Like, you really can't complain about that. And in the playoffs against the Oi, like, uh, for the, were they, yeah, yeah, first first round, round, um, two goals, two assists. So, I mean, like, are you just getting Pierre Luc Dubois light out of Gabe Velarde? Yeah. And he's also a right hand shot, which, like, we, ultimately may need in the future like and he's also one of those players that can play wing but I think he's also played center in his career as well so back in like the junior and maybe coming up through the the AHL so he could also be an option as like a second line center maybe so so yeah he might take a few years to grow but if he sticks around Winnipeg like yeah might be a bit of a diamond in the rough kind of a situation where he might not be Pierre-Luc Dubois but you know he'll be a pretty good Gabe Velarde yeah right well I mean look at like (laughs) we kind of talked about it a little bit this week, like Morgan Barron kind of being a uh, Andrew Kopp light. And it's like, but the dude's just turned into his own player. So I, yeah. y- y- you love to see that. Um, and what do you know about Alex Aiello? I fellow. Yeah. He like his story is like pretty great too. Like he was an undrafted player, went to university for four years and then signs with the LA Kings. And he's not going to wow you with his point totals. Like, He's probably like a good maybe 40-point guy, maybe 50 points if he really gets the right deployment and line mates. But like he's kind of just like Andrew Cup in that way where you can put him on any line and he he won't be a detriment to that line. I think we saw that sometime this year when we had at the beginning of the year where like Fialbi was playing with Connor and Dubois or Sam Gagne. Like not that these players aren't good, but they weren't. The they weren't the right line. fit. They yeah, didn't have yeah. that talent where, yeah, I, IFLO does. And I mean, I don't like know said, how good like, he did. Yeah. I, I, again, I haven't watched many LA games and I kind of ignored the Oilers in the first round. 
um, because I was sulking about the Jets, but that's okay. <laughs> um, so, but like, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, what was it? 36 points in uh, 59 games. Like, yeah, well, you know, another 40 point guy, like really we're filling out the middle six here. Like yeah. kind of locking it down. You're like the Jets are most likely losing. Uh, what's his Dubois, name? Wheeler. Nope. nope. Uh, the guy we brought in with uh, Nino Ryder last uh, during the trade deadline. Why am I blanking on him? Mastikov. Mastikov. Like we're probably losing him. So you you know you fill in that slate with one of these guys. Yeah. So like it, it it feels a little bit better going into yeah. next season, especially if assuming this trade does go through. Like I'm kind of yeah. sold on these guys, and if the Jets somehow manage to wheel out a uh, prospect or a draft pick on top of this, yeah, money in the bank. I think one thing about this trade too is like. We've seen with the top six with the Jets, like it's been really top heavy. Like we have Shifley, we got Connor, we got Ehlers. I think this trade, even though we're trading like almost like a star player esque and we're not getting a star player back, I think it gives the Jets a lot more depth and kind of better. Like they might be losing out on a top six center, but they're getting someone that could be a top six center in the future and they're building a more like complete lineup. Like they're yeah. building a team that's. Like, Ayafalo's no slouch, Velarde's no slouch, but, like, obviously Dubois is what Dubois is. He's a, a good physical presence, and it might be hard to replace that, but I like the kind of direction that the Jets are going with a more complete lineup. and kind of reminds me of, like, what Seattle has, like, where, like, a lot of players have opportunity and, like, every line can be dangerous. And if the Jets can somehow find that where every single line kind of has like if I have follows on that third line with like Lowry and Appleton like I feel like that line could be pretty dangerous as well so Ray let's just say this trade goes through the Jets run it pretty much back for the rest of the summer going into next year Do, are the Jets better than they were yesterday assuming this is the trade that goes through I don't like I don't think they're a better team in the sense that like their skill is better but I think they are better in the way that they're going about these trades and kind of the change that that need to be made. Like, obviously they could trade Dubois and get like only picks or only futures, but they realize that Velarde is only a 23 year old who just had a breakout season in LA and maybe LA doesn't want to pay him or they want to cash in on that value. But like Velarde is a good player. And if we can like build on what he had last year and I follow too, and if it doesn't work out, then we can always trade them as well. And like, I think it's basically giving the Jets like a whole new look. It may not be like the best deal per se that they could get. Like, obviously, you want to get the best deal. Like, you want to get like, I don't know, like Byfield and like a first and all these other assets. But I think that they're doing the right steps in evaluating where they want to be. And getting players that fit that, but also young players as well. Yeah. So better depth. I like it. Uh, yeah. yeah. Personally, I'm I'm a fan of this, and I think uh, like when we talk about our way too early expectations <laughs> of the Jets next time, we talk about that. I think we'll have higher hopes for this team. Um, again, we'll see what happens with Connor Hallibuck. That's going to be the big one. Yeah. Uh, the next big piece, I hope, falls soon. Uh, we also Blake Wheeler. I guess that's got to happen real soon here too yeah, yeah. Uh, you think is <laughs> are you buying him out because like a lot everyone's like oh yeah he's getting bought out he's getting bought out but then frank sarvalli's like there's a good chance he gets traded and i'm like I yeah oh i think that like the way that like if he was going to be bought out was wheeler basically not assisting in that kind of discussion about a trade like say he only wanted to go to like Tampa or Arizona and like these teams that don't want to trade for him then mm -hmm. I felt like a buyout was kind of the only way because he's not going to kind of cooperate with you but it kind of seems that both the Jets and Blake Wheeler's like agent and himself kind of realized that like yeah a change kind of would be nice so I think that Wheeler is going to kind of help the Jets and the Jets are going to kind of help him and kind of have that discussion on like where do you want to go and like like where like what opportunity would you want to go to and so he might still get bought out it really depends on the cap he's really highly paid 8.2 million so 
I'm not like there's a discussion to be made too about like if you're fully fully retaining on Wheeler, you're basically keeping four million dollars on the cap for that one season. But if you buy him out, you're only having two point seven five million on the cap. So you're save like if you fully retain, you definitely have to be getting a better deal than what uh Ryan Johansson got from Colorado with just Alex Galchenyuk's rights. Because and, and those rights if you are buy expiring out, on July first too. Yeah. So like, if you can retain on him, sure. Like if you can get like maybe like a third round pick back, it needs to be worth retaining and trading him, where you're getting an asset that is better than saying, "Hey, we can just use that extra two million dollars in cap, take the penalty next year, so be it, and have more cap space this off season to kind of have more flexibility and." signing players and even maybe taking on contracts that other teams wouldn't want. But I think with Nashville, I think Barry Trotz is trying to clean house as much as possible. And he's like fully accepting that this is his team. He is going to break it and then rebuild it into a Barry Trotz team, which look out for the Nashville Predators in two and a half seasons, three seasons, because they're going to be real good under that guy. Um, Yeah. But yeah, like that, like he's just clearing cap. So I mean, getting if you're clearing cap for that reason, then of course you're going to take an Alex Galchenyuk co- um, contract yeah. that's expiring in two weeks. But like Blake Wheeler, I think it's um, it's like a it's a culture thing. It's a him thing. Like there's a lot of people that are like everyone wants to move on from the situation. Uh, we're all better off for it. It's it's just a breakup that needs to happen. Like we're sorry, Blake. I love you, but. Um, Got to move on. Yeah. So, I don't know. I I, so I kind of see somebody go like taking a big swing on him, but they also know you could probably sign Blake Wheeler for. Well, I guess he was a sixty point guy or like a three quarter yeah. a point player still. So like, yeah, I don't know. Does he still earn like four million dollars by it? Like without. Like, I don't think so. Contract? No. I think uh, I saw I saw a TikTok from the Oilers Nation where they were talking about Blake Wheeler and you actually had a comment on that yes. about signing him to a cheap deal to play in the top six and like I feel like he'd get like that like one year kind of two to three million dollar deal and I feel like Edmonton would be a pretty good destination for him all things considered to like you play alongside McDavid like yeah like you're going to put up points and like, you might be, someone might be like, yeah, I'll pay you a little bit more. Like I might pay you 4 million. So. Oh boy. Yeah. Yeah. If, uh, if the former captain goes to Edmonton and let's just say he's real, like he really wants to win. He takes it for a million dollars that. Yeah. Oh man. The Oilers depth would be insane at that point and scary. So. Also some news that just came out from Ken Weeb. Um, they're also expecting that Jansen Harkins may be involved in the deal going oh. to LA. So interesting. Yeah. How do you feel about losing Harkins? I like in the play in round in the 2020 season, like he was absolutely amazing. Like I, when he filled in for all the injured players and just all that, like I felt like he could be basically what Baron is now, like kind of that, like, third maybe fourth line guy that's just like a lot like he wouldn't like he has more skill than what he is and would provide value on that like third fourth line and have some good depth there but I think that with with him being in the AHL most of the year and having that success like he was he was not an AHL player this past year and just kind of didn't have like he's played like like what like twenty games with the yeah, Jets he, this season. He didn't get a fair shot, and once uh, Fialbi stepped in, that was kind of the end yeah. of the Harkins experiment. Yeah, so I'm not surprised that he's involved. Like I obviously I would have loved to see him work out with the Jets, but it's not someone that I'm like crying over or being like, oh, why are we trading Harkins in this deal too? And I feel like Harkins could be a really good kind of replacement because they're probably wanting to keep some cheaper kind of young players for that bottom six and i feel like jansen harkins on la's like fourth line like he could provide a good amount of value there yeah oh absolutely so yeah i i think we're gonna see a lot of those prospects around his age start to move out as well this year like if the jets legitimately want to go chase then yeah okay 
Let, uh, let me ask you this question. It's um, would you take one more year of Connor Hellebuck and like the Jets make it to the third round and everything up to that point or after that is just a big old mystery? Would you keep Hellebuck for one more year for a cup run or would you go risk for a new goaltender and just kind of let whatever this team is do its thing? That is, that's like such a difficult question because. It's like, I want the Jets to succeed. I want to see Connor Hellebuck, like, win a Stanley Cup with the Jets. But it's like, if we run it back, like, and we already have, like, notifications from all these insiders saying that Hellebuck probably doesn't want to resign. Mm -hmm. And I feel like as much as I would want to see the Jets go on one last run and kind of with this core that we've seen throughout, like, like, the past, like, five, six years, like, this has been the core of a lot of Jets fans tenure as a fan and but ultimately like the Jets can't be the Jets are the last team that can be wasting away like an asset like that like Hellbuck on the open market right now can commend so much and basically like as much as I want to say that he could help the Jets next season and just kind of deal with the the consequences of what happens I think that the Jets kind of need to go in this new direction because like you always have to change in the NHL and not a lot of things stay the same. So going with this new kind of direction, I think is something that the Jets don't really want to embrace, but something that they kind of have to embrace with just how long they've had this core for. Mm -hmm. Well, and like Hellebuck is just so streaky in the playoffs. Cause I mean, we'll see him go yeah. on these huge runs where you're like, what was in the, like when they took on the Oilers, he had like what a nine, 38 939 save percentage just some ungodly number and then he gets into the second round with montreal is like down the drain and i mean yeah. it happened this year with vegas and you're just like is he a playoff goalie i think he's a playoff goalie i think that yeah. like i think that like if you look at like just the vegas series too like he didn't have the greatest vegas series but if you look at all the other goalies that vegas played like not a lot of the goalies had very good series against vegas either mm -hmm. so i don't think i don't think it's on hellebuck obviously you want your goalie to be that kind of difference maker in a series and maybe hasn't been in recent years but like with how good he's been like three vesna nominations in six years like it's obviously there i think he just maybe it's just not with the jets that he's gonna find that kind of next playoff step in his career nice Okay, I I can accept that. I just yeah. you know, I I've been going to golf tournaments lately, so everyone asks me all these questions. So and a lot of guys, well, Hellebuck isn't a playoff goalie, so I, I'm interested in that answer. Also, if you look at the injuries that the Jets have faced in the playoffs, like how can we expect that guy to put all of that extra pressure on his shoulders, plus the one or two guys who somehow remained healthy the entire time? Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right, we got a shout out Dr. PP time on Instagram. Fantastic yeah. username. Uh, we asked for <laughs> questions because we were kind of like before today, we were like, what are we even going to talk about? So let's shout out this guy, Dr. PP time. Mm -hmm. Give him a follow on Instagram. I actually didn't look at his uh, feed, so it, he might have good stuff. He might yeah. not. I'm going to say he's got good stuff because he's got great questions. <laughs> Um, and before we get to his questions, let's shout out our friends at Betway one more time. I need a new liner, guys. Tell me what <laughs> I need to say. But until then, be sure to check out the latest, I don't know, probably CFL odds with online sports book Betway. Ray, you a CFL guy? Uh, no, not oh, really. <laughs> ugh, classic Toronto or Ontario guys don't care about the CFL. Either way. Did you? I, I know you don't care, but for everyone that's in Winnipeg and get and cares, Drew Wolitarski, one of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, is also a musician who is phenomenal. Uh, I watched him play today at a uh, charity thing we were at, and yeah, dude's got some pipes and knows how to make catches. So Drew Wolitarski, you got a big thumbs up for me. <laughs> um, all right, uh, Doctor PP Times, first of many questions. What's the direction of the Jet, or what's the direction the Jets should go to build a cup contender? I think they're kind of going in that direction right now where it's like they're not fully rebuilding, but they're kind of trading away the players that don't want to stay or maybe they don't see in that long-term plan and kind of getting younger players. Like we see this like with Velarde and stuff like that. Like 
if Fullardi can develop into like a 65, maybe 70 point kind of just center, like we could have almost like a replica Dubois right there. And not to mention all the other assets we get from there. So I think it's not fully rebuilding and kind of tearing everything down. But I also don't think that it's running it back and not really adapting to what the team kind of needs. I think that we need to go through some of these kind of pains in losing these players that we've all kind of loved seeing for the past couple of years and kind of creating a team where the culture in the locker room is a lot better. Ultimately, that's been something that has been kind of nipped at by outside opinions for many years. But I think that they're doing the right steps and it will definitely come down to what players get traded and kind of what the trades are looking like. And we can even probably see this within the draft where if they draft like a forward versus a defenseman, like you can kind of see where they think their needs in the future will lie. Yeah. Well, I mean, if we're uh, listening to you, it's going to be a defenseman in the first round. Very yeah, exciting. Um, which prospect has the most potential with the Jets right now? Most potential? Yes. Are you also going to say one? Well, yeah. So okay. better not steal I'll... mine. Otherwise, I got to come up with a new one. It's going to be a bad answer. <laughs> okay, I'm going to say one that's really off the board. I'd love to say Brad Lambert here, but I think I've tooted his horn good amount enough here. I'm going to say Elias Solomonson in Ooh. the SHL. When I was reading up on this guy, like the amount of like change that the coach went through, like he wasn't even seen as someone that could be on the SHL team. And then by the end of the year, his coach was saying like, yeah, he was our most important defenseman that year and just was basically a great, reliable two-way defenseman. He wasn't a perfect defenseman. He wasn't going to be like, he's probably not going to be this like top, kind of 20 defensemen in the league but i think that like the amount of kind of intriguing aspects to his game like he could probably be someone like brett pesci i think of kind of that type of player and like those types of players like might not be the most attractive defensemen they may not be the best defensemen but i think they're the most vital defensemen that kind of go unnoticed and kind of those type of players are the cornerstones of contending teams you mean like Brennan Dillon? Yeah. Like that like <laughs> you, you need guys like that. You need good defenders who can go get up and down the ice. And Brennan Dillon playing a like almost a two-way game this last season, although it didn't work out for him yeah. a whole lot. That dude in front of the net was some of the best yeah. I've seen. Um, honestly, my uh prospect, Rutger McGrory, the Nebraska yeah. boy. I uh, just you know, you watch him play, and I watched a couple of his college games this past year, and just like the game that he brings, it, he might end up just being like, a, like a, a an Adam Lowry type, but he's that's just something every team needs, and just the passion that he has for the Winnipeg Jets already as a young guy, like you know that guy was a fan from the day from day one, yeah. right? So Rutger McGordy, just because he's got such a big heart and like loves this team, I think he's willing to learn. He's gonna be. Yeah. The next one. Next great I, one. I really wanted to say Chaz Lucius. I'm going to mention him. Just because, like, how much kind of adversity he's gone through, like, he had in his draft year and even this year. So, I think that if he can kind of have a really good season in the AHL this next year, like, I wouldn't be surprised to see him being a top six forward in the future. So, mm, I like that one. Yeah. Um, The next Jets captain is? Josh Morrissey. Josh Morrissey. Yeah, that's the that's the easy layup answer. I yeah. still want it to be Adam Lowry. And then and then passes it along to Rutger McGrady. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Um I mean <laughs> we also gotta get Ehlers and A at some point too, because yeah. that guy that guy's a beauty. Like the Swedish or not the Swedish, the Danish king. I love him. <laughs> um da, 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 da. oh. Is Mark Chipman's and management hurting and Jets management hurting the Jets future. But I mean, I, I don't think so. Like if this trade goes through today, maybe he sometimes makes mistakes as a, like if, yeah. if Mark Chipman, you know, legitimately does interfere with uh, getting things done in Winnipeg, then yeah. Yeah. Sometimes he gets in his own way, but yeah. who doesn't. Right. Yeah. I think like, I wouldn't say that they're actively going against kind of the direction of the team, mm -hmm. but I also wouldn't like, 
I feel like owners are kind of like that where they might not be hin- like they might be hindering your team in some spots, but then they also might be benefiting your team in some spots. So overall, they're kind of just almost net neutral. Yeah. But I think it also depends on owner to owner. Like I would say Chipman's probably just around that neutral ground. But if you see something like in Toronto, like I feel like Toronto is a different case where yeah. Shanahan and stuff like that. Like I feel like that's where you're taking away from the team there. Well, yeah, it's like if you have a GM, let him be a GM. I actually yeah. just saw Mr. Chipman this week uh, while I was uh, working outside uh, the rink there, and he was walking around with some development camp they were doing. So they must have been doing some office stuff there. But yeah. uh, it's a lot shorter than I was expecting. Um, but yeah, I think he does get in the way. But if you look at some other owners who really start to you know get their fingerprints and everything, it's kind of a mess. I mean, look at yeah. Vancouver right now and their owner. It's just like, yeah. I would hate to have that guy. <laughs> yeah. And like Daryl Cates with the Oilers, you know, he, his fingerprints were all over that team for years until Ken Holland show, showed up and was like, actually, this is how we're running things. So, yeah. I think it's just an overall, like, you wish they could be better, but like, yeah. you kind of appreciate them for what they are and they're not worse than they are. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and the Jets are in that happy medium of they give us so much hope every single year and i mean i'm going going to next <laughs> season believing this is the team that's going to win the stanley cup and you can't prove <laughs> that tell me different until they're eliminated <laughs> uh do, 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 do. um oh, i hated this question but i appreciate it um after the drama of the jets potentially uh ro- relocating because of Mark Chipman's comments. I don't know about Mark Chipman's mm-hmm. comments, but like we remember that video that the Jets put out there in the spring where it's like uh come to our games. Even... Sorry? <laughs> I think it was I think he's referring to kind of like that uh like come to the games and we'll like stay here or something like that. Like Yeah. And but it's not even don't... like it's the people of Winnipeg who suck at this. It's the fact that no corporate sponsors want to buy seats at these games. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, if they were to put in that three. It's echoing for some reason. Uh, if you were to get those 3,000 seats sold, which I mean, like Winnipeg's a relatively small city. So, you know, where's the corporate sponsors? Because they yeah. suck at getting into this city. Like, uh, this is just a personal thing. But I've like a <laughs> lot of major corporations, I've, I've heard it three or four times where it's like, we love Winnipeg. Winnipeg is like an Edmonton, Toronto, Vancouver but not really for some reason yeah. it's just not the same. And it's like, what do you mean by that? And I just, for whatever reason, Winnipeg is just missed. Yeah. And they're like, so whichever major corporations are hearing this and they're kind of mad about it. It's like, go buy some tickets, send your corporate boys to jets games. It'll probably yeah. help your bottom line somehow. Yeah. So yeah. Um, I, I don't just, think they move. No, like, just I, with the NHL. It's like, you don't like, the like i think the last thing the nhl wants to do is kind of move teams yeah because i I feel like that's just gonna create so much drama and kind of you're just like ripping out an entire fan bases kind of like that like their nhl franchise and like we saw this in the past like it's not a fun thing to go through and like even though it might be better for the nhl to say move arizona to houston as much as it's kind of joked about like arizona still has a dedicated fan base and they're still trying to become a better NHL team. And then you remove that like kind of opportunity from them to be like, you don't make enough money. We're going to move you. And yeah. It's like, and I think Arizona's would... had how much controversy since 2004, like how many they've gone through how many owners they've moved, how many t- three times it's they, yeah. And they were put in a bad location. Like had the original ownership actually kind of, put a little bit more thought into it rather than being like, Oh yeah, let's get the team out of Winnipeg. Yeah. Very dumb. Um, But yeah, Gary Bettman had a lot to do with getting the thrashers up this way. And I know we love to rip on Gary Bettman because he's just the ultimate villain here, but he's done a lot of good to bring Winnipeg back, but we do need fuller seats, unfortunately, but yeah, I don't see the team actually moving unless we start seeing numbers dip below like 9,000 fans a night. Yeah. But the future is bright, buddy. I'm feeling good about this team. So, yeah, that's why I kind of hate yeah. those questions because it's like everyone tries to push the well, at, you know, 
no one wants to play hockey in Winnipeg, so you might as well just relocate the team because it's already happened once. I think the Calgary Flames like actually stand the biggest risk of moving, yeah. unfortunately. Uh, like, I don't know. Like, I know I've heard stuff about the rink coming, but. I think it's going to be hard to move kind of any Canadian team. Yeah. Yeah. It would be incredibly hard. hard. And like the diehard fans would be passed. Like I, yeah. Calgary would fundamentally fall apart for 15 years if they lost. Yeah. Like I don't think they can just lose. Like even as much as they like might want to move Calgary, like then you're just removing the battle of Alberta and that's yeah. become something that's like been like a major kind of rivalry and yeah. you don't really want to touch that. But like, the, if you look at Calgary's arena, I don't know if you've ever been to Calgary. It's a gorgeous city, <laughs> but you drive past, not be... <laughs> yeah, you drive past the saddle though. And you're like, the hell is this thing? It just looks like a saddle, like obviously. <laughs> um, and it's it's awful, man. You sit in the seats, you're like, oh, cool. These are going to break any moment. I'm going to have a massive scar down my leg and, in, and okay. external bleeding. And like, <laughs> it looks like, you know, the concrete's going to fumble or start to crumble there at the top. Like it's an <laughs> old rink and it was a weird design of a rink too. So thanks, 19... 19- 80 Olympics? One of the other Olympics that happened in, the only Olympics that happened in Calgary. Um, Ray, we've got a draft coming up this week. Yes, we do. So, Jets, drafting 18th overall. Uh, Give me your two uh, desired prospects here. I'm going to go with actually two Western Canadian forwards, actually. One is kind of wishful thinking and Brandon Yeager with the Moose Jaw Warriors. And my other one is actually kind of this like boom or bust prospect that we've seen kind of been linked like Lambert and Andrew Kristall. Both had very good years in the WHL. And I think that both of them have more to give than teams like. And Kristall is like one that's like he had like 97 points in the WHL. And for some reason, people have him like some ranking agencies have him in the third round. Like, and I'm like, that guy, like, is one of those guys that's like, sure, if he hits, he's going to be amazing, but he might not hit. So it's like, I think I like, and the Jets need to take some swings. So, but if, but if the Jets are taking a defenseman, I'll add in, I think they're going to go with Wallander. He's a right-handed Swedish defenseman. So. (laughs) Right on. Uh, Man, I just I always feel so inadequate when you like we do these <laughs> things. It's like you just w- like rip off knowledge, and so I just like I was just kind of like, where the hell do I go for this? Because I don't know much about prospects and like who's really going to be good. Uh, but uh, I've seen Gabe Perot. per- Perot's name a few times, yeah. and like le- small left wing forward. But I mean, we could use a little bit more left handed skill in this on this team, yeah. and especially if uh, yeah, he still- led the. The U.S. in points this year over someone, Will Smith, who's like projected to go like top five. So yeah, so we'll take it, right? I mean, uh, obviously Connor Bedard's going to drop to eight. <laughs> uh, you know, history is just going to be amazing here in Winnipeg. Um, I also wouldn't mind uh, Dmitry Sim- Simashev. Simashev, yeah. Yeah, uh, I know he's supposed to kind of go a little bit hot, like not higher, but, you know, kind of in that 10 to 15 range. Yeah. But I mean, like a left-handed defenseman, like yeah. just something like, I know there's a backlog, but, you know, that <laughs> backlog is going to get cleared up eventually. And defensemen, yeah. they're they're voodoo. They're, they're like goalies. It takes time for them to get to that point where they're going. So we could use that. Yeah. Although he is Russian. I forgot <laughs> about that. Shoot. Yeah, that's why I went with the Western guys, just because yeah. it you're drafting a Canadian guy. I feel like I feel like the Jets almost need a little bit more Canadian. Yeah, you really do. Uh because yeah, drafting all of these Minnesotans and uh Euro guys, you know, it's yeah. it, it's working, but at the same time, bring like I up. like if you ask me right now, I wouldn't know the Jets top forward prospect who is also a Canadian. Like Lambert's not Canadian. Chad nope. Lucius is American. Yep. Rutger is American. Although I think Brad the best Lambert's one is... like semi-Canadian. Yeah, He's... I don't count him though. Okay. I think the best one is then Danny Zilkin. It's like I feel like you want that. I feel like you want to have like a Canadian that has upside or something like that. Yeah. But... 
I mean, it'd be great. Like, I mean, look at Vegas. They just won with, what is it? Four Manitobans that actually played on the, yeah. in the playoffs. So bring up us, uh, bring up your old Manitoba boys yeah. there, Kevin Shevel day off. We'll be fine. Jaeger is from Saskatchewan. And I don't know where, I don't know. And Chris Stahl is from Vancouver. So. Hmm. Do you Could have be. a sirens running past your place? Yeah, there? I do. I do. <laughs> I have my window open. <laughs> Are you in like a sketchy part of the GTA? No, it's just like I'm. I live beside like a popular street, so uh, they they're going down the, that street a lot. Fair enough. They've been ripping up my uh, like my street in front of my house with the like and like not just like you know, putting on a new layer of asphalt, they're ripping down and like going 10 feet deep, ripping <laughs> out water mains and like, Oh, awful. They start right at seven o'clock. And like, I wake up for seven thirties and like, you guys are killing me here. So I have to awkwardly like drink a cup and a half of coffee rather than my single one. Um, all right. This week has been crazy news wise. I mean, every week's crazy news wise, right? Um, yeah. Elon Musk and, good old mark zuckerberg apparently want to fight you got a hundred dollars who are you betting on i'm betting on elon you're elon eh yeah Any i just reason? can't i can't picture zuckerberg actually being able to like like fight someone like it just seems so like i don't he's know he's a jujitsu champion though i don't know i don't like <laughs> like no <laughs> it's just that simple <laughs> no I don't know. I think it's just two alien species that are just too awkward. But like, I uh, I want to believe in Zuck on this one. So, yeah. um, all right. This is just like we all know what happened with the billionaire and their spacecraft. But uh, this is a question I'd always ask at camp: Would you rather go spend a year under the sea or go for a year of space exploration? That's tough uh what what would you do i would do space man i love space like there's my youtube is literally just hockey in space right now okay um i think going underwater would be pretty cool i think i feel like the like just humans as a general like they don't know like about the ocean as much so i feel like that'd be cool to kind of see like maybe you see a species of fish that like you don't even we don't even know yet so but I guess you could always find like aliens or something. So yeah, I mean, you could find mer people at the bottom of the ocean. We all remember that fake documentary from Discovery like twelve <laughs> years ago. That did you ever get got by something like that? I don't think so. No, no. man, <laughs> it got like me and like five other guys in my class. We were like, "Did you guys see that?" And we were like, "Yeah, that was some insane stuff." So I was like, <laughs> "Mermaids definitely real for." <laughs> I was in yeah. high school, so I'm not proud of myself, but uh, <laughs> better than believing in house hippos. <laughs> <laughs> um, we got Canada Day coming up next week. Uh, Saturday, I think. Who's your favorite Canadian artist? I think it has to be Nickelback. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I just saw them here at Canada Life on Thursday, Tuesday. I saw them on Tuesday. Yeah. They put on a phenomenal show. Like, it doesn't get much better than that. And the pyrotechnics, like, I was almost at the back of the building and just still felt like I was cooking there. So that's a good answer. <laughs> Favorite song by Nickelback? Uh, Rockstar. Rockstar. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Uh, I'm a, I'm a older, I, I, I'm an old school guy, and it's a tragically hip for me. Like by far the greatest band ever, not even best Canadian band. Uh, but when I moved to Manitoba, it was their final show in Kingston and they were playing it on the CBC and I was driving in somewhere Saskatchewan and it had to pull over just because I started weeping because it was like starting a new <laughs> chapter of my life and Fiddler's Green is on and it's just so emotional. A gorgeous <laughs> sunset though. So thanks Gord Downey and the Lord working together to create just a beautiful moment for me. So, <laughs> uh, Ray, yeah. anything else this week? Uh, I don't think so. No. Did we get an official trade yet? Yeah, I've been checking on that. Um, more basically, just that is probably going to be more than I follow and Velarde, but that's not All good right. enough. So, Velarde, the trade, I follow. 
for Harkins and PLD. I'm going to say that's a fair swap. Yeah, but I want more. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I respect it. Uh, all right. Uh, be sure to check out Betway for the latest sports odds. Uh, have yourself a fantastic week. I'm sure you can make some cool prop bets with them uh, for the draft. So uh, for me and my kitty, yeah. have a great week. <laughs> oh, also follow Ray on uh, Instagram, Ray. Yeah. Now, and Brad Lambert is him. If you guys want to ask your questions, do that. We'll shut you out. So yeah. Dr. PP also give him a follow. Dr. Yeah. PP time, whatever it is. Uh, <laughs> give me a follow. Angus Hout at, on Instagram and Twitter. JetsNation.ca. Yeah. Ray, yeah. <laughs> have a great week. Yeah. yeah, see you Thursday. See you Thursday. Go Jets, go. Go Jets, go.